In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, the Gainai, the Beacony, the Stony Nakoda, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes on Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. The What Works Speaker Series was developed um, in response to the feedback we received from you, our SAIT alumni. The focus of this series is on career development, industry connections, and how SAIT can be a lifelong partner in both your education and your career. A huge out shout out to the many film and video production students on the webinar this evening. We hope this is an opportunity for you to learn from SAIT alumni and begin your relationship with us here in the alumni office. This evening, we are joined by two SAIT grads, Matt Waterworth and Scott Westby. We are joined by Luke Azevedo from the Calgary Economic Development. And our moderator for this evening is Chris Giardino from the Film, Video and Production uh, program here at SAIT. I'm looking forward to learning more about Scott and Matt's recently released film, In Plain View, and what's new in the industry in Alberta. To those who submitted their questions in advance of this event, thank you. We received some really interesting ones, so I'm really excited to delve into that. I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A area throughout the conversation. So we encourage you to post questions in that box throughout the hour. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Chris uh, to start the conversation. Thank you very much, Madeline. And I guess I'll also open by saying thank you to everyone who signed up for tonight and uh, coming to this panel. We really appreciate your participation and I hope you find this uh, very fascinating. I know I'm certainly looking forward to it. I would like to do sort of start with each panelist individually and get them to explain a little bit about more about who they are and how they function within the, uh, the Calgary community of filmmakers, but also, also when I go to Matt and Scott, also tell us a bit about the film. I'll start with Luke. I'm Luke Azevedo. I'm uh, Vice President of Creative Industries and Film Commissioner with Calgary Economic Development. Um, my job entails um, a variety of things. Uh, <laughs> first and foremost, um, marketing and sales of the region. Uh, for film, television, digital media, and gaming, uh, as well as uh, advocacy work with um, the provincial and the, the federal governments as, and the municipality. Um, my team at Calgary Economic Development is the one window access uh, to permits, access to buildings, um, and activity that is uh, derived around film and television. And so we play a variety of different roles um, from attraction to facilitation um, to then the activation of the projects and then work with, uh, with gentlemen like uh, Scott and Matt when we have opportunities to help grow and develop um, our local talent and give uh, these gentlemen and others as many opportunities as we can for them to be able to tell their uh, Alberta stories to the world. Thank you very much. So it's safe to say if someone's in the film industry in Alberta, they'll be encountering you at some point. Fair enough? Um, probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Then we'll go over to, uh, to Matt. Hey, is this, uh, am I, is my sound still good? I had a bit of an issue before. It sounds good on my end. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Matt. Um, Scott and I graduated the film and video production program back in 2008. Um, I did some work for the, uh, the amazing 724 films right after school. Um, I, I, Scott and I both sat on the board of the Calgary Society of Independent Filmmakers for many years. I'm now currently a member of the Alberta Media Production Industries Association. Uh, and uh, love building community. Um, I'm doing some work with CSIF right now as well as, as a sort of interim staff member. Uh, so I, uh, and then of course, as a filmmaker, um, you know, Scott and I uh, started making short films together and that evolved into making some feature films. And our first feature film was In Plain View, which is up uh, again in my background there. So um, yeah, hopefully people have had a chance to, to check it out. I saw some people uh, were using the, 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 the coupon code. So, uh, and others have been using it today. So I'm sure you haven't had a chance yet, but looking forward to, to hearing thoughts or, or uh, having people enjoy it after the fact as well. Thank you very much, Matt. Yes, we certainly have a lot of questions of uh, students and alumni who are very curious about how you went about making the film and so forth. So thank you. Scott? Thanks, Chris. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Scott Westby. Uh, my, my story parallels Matt, of course, in a lot of ways. We graduated together and we started Full Swing Productions um, a few years after film school, uh, you know, with the goal to be in charge of our own time and, and make movies and TV shows. Um, and it's a long journey. Uh, it's a hard journey and, and you know Luke has been a massive help in that journey and that's a big reason of why uh, we're happy to have him here today. Um, so we, we produced uh, our first feature in Plain View in 2016 and then we shot another one called Jones in 2018 and it's going through post-production right now. And then we've made a couple of series with TELUS um, 
And yeah, we're always kind of looking toward the next project. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Well, thank you very much, Scott. And thank you to all of you for being here. Um, before I start with the first question, I will say I watched In Plain View uh, over the weekend on Amazon Prime, <clears throat> excuse me, and I should say it's a wonderful film and what you've been able to accomplish with it in terms of the scope and the breadth of it, uh, the locations, which I would like to ask you a bit more with the locations later, um, because I certainly think with uh, Alberta, we have something to offer that a lot of other provincial film hubs don't have in terms of our look and our aesthetic. But to start off, the first question that we have here is so we'll have to know that given this is your first film, what was one of the biggest surprises, either as a positive or a negative, that you learned throughout the process? Uh, for me, it was the budget. So um, we got $250,000 to make this movie. Um, some of that came from Telefilm, which is the federal government. Some of it came from the Alberta government. And some of it came out of our own pockets. Um, and when I was budgeting for it, um, and just for people watching, I, I acted as the producer on that film and Matt was the director. And then we swapped for our second feature for Jonesen. Um, I thought I thought a quarter million dollars was a ton. And, and we were gonna, you know, we were gonna eat caviar all day and you know, unlimited crew members and all the gear that we wanted. Um, and so when I built my first budget for it before we even applied for the money, um, I think I had like 1.2 million that I was, that I thought was going to be it. So I, I learned very quickly um, how little money that is to actually make a movie. So that was kind of my big first, oh shit moment. And then part of the ingenuity of being a producer is making that amount of money spread out. So it looks like a lot more than it actually is. Which Absolutely. I think Absolutely. Thank you. How about you, Matt? Uh, it's going to sound cheesy, but but honestly, it was it was surprising all the support we had. I mean, Scott Scott, I, I steal this from Scott all the time. You know, speaking of the budget, it was the budget plus seven miracles. One of those miracles was was Luke and Lissa and and, and the office um, helping us find some incredible locations that we really couldn't have made the film without. And and that goes for the crew and the cast that everybody just poured so much uh, of themselves into this film, and and it just wouldn't have happened without without so much of that support. So. I knew we would get some. I didn't expect how much we would get. So it's pretty incredible, including yeah. SAIT as well. So many SAIT um, alumni and students uh, were part of the process as well. One of the things that you mentioned is how it was funded, you know, partially out of your own pocket, partially through telefilm, different grants and funding bodies. Certainly the financing for films, feature films in particular in Canada, is very different than what you might see with the American model. Can you take us through a bit of that process of the whole of the applications? I know some of the students are learning that right now. What does that actually mean to sort of go through to apply for funding? And the other, I'd say as a part B to that, is it's not always guaranteed. Lots of applications come out, the competition is very fierce. Um, if a student does apply for funding or financing and they don't get it when they qualify, should they give up or keep going? Oh, definitely give up. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is, you know what, that never changes. Um, you're going to hear no for your entire career. Um, I'm sure a lot of the people listening probably didn't make it into the state program, but they are students on their first try. Um, it just takes, it takes persistence. It takes resiliency. This, this industry, um, you got to have a, a thick skin and a thick armor. Um, and that, that, that will never change. Um, I'm sure Luke knows that as well. So for as far as financing this particular feature goes, um, we applied for a, a program called the Telefilm Microbudget Program. Nowadays, it's called the Talent to Watch Program. And putting together that application, just the application was probably about two weeks of work for us. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. There's no guarantees that you're going to get it. Um, you know, it involved putting the entire budget together, Matt created this um, kind of a mood reel. Um, and he had a lookbook that he did up. We put in a financing structure. Um, we had a bunch of key creatives attached to the project. So, so, you know, we knew who, obviously the director was gonna be, but we knew who the cinematographer was gonna be. We had our editor attached so that Telefilm could really see um, who the team was. And then the other component was, um, you know, Matt and I have, have backgrounds in marketing and social media that we kind of cultivated after we graduated from state. And we put a, a pretty substantial marketing um, and promotion and distribution plan together. Um, and within our pitch video, that actually ended up being about half of our pitch was how we were going to take this film and put it in front of audiences. So, you know, an understanding of um, a feature film as a product for export is, is a massive, uh, will be a massive boon to you as a filmmaker and understanding that it is a business. Um, and what does that business look like? So, yeah, I'll, I'll shut up for a little while about that. 
I mean, to be honest, I'm glad you mentioned it. And that's the one thing that we try to reiterate is that on the one hand, you can have the best film in, in the planet, fantastic. But if no one sees it, if there's no way to actually get it out, so eyes are watching it, you know, having uh, people in the seats watching it while they're streaming it, um, then it's for naught. It's a, it's a fruitless endeavor. Um, now that it's on Amazon Prime, how did you do that? What was the process to get it on Amazon Prime? And I believe iTunes too, is that correct? Yeah, Apple TV. Um, Apple yeah, TV so we actually, we, we partnered with a distributor called Fabrication Films um, who distributed the film internationally. So they, they have, you know, brought it out in territories like Russia, um, the Middle East, South America, and that was all kind of done in partnership with them and they took that on and they took care of it. Um, and we, we had a partnership with a distributor um, in the States and it did not work out. And that's a whole, you know, we could spend hours talking about that particular relationship and the things that we learned from that situation. But, um, you know, with Amazon Prime and Apple TV, you can actually self-distribute. And so that's the route that we took. Um, you, you need to go through an aggregator. You need to partner with a company that's called an aggregator. Um, in our case, it was a company called Bitmax. They're wonderful to work with. Um, and, you know, there is, there is a quality control check. And, you know, there are, there are gatekeepers there a little bit who, who, you know, vet your film before it goes on. Um, but that was, you know, it's been really empowering to be able to put our film on Amazon Prime and, and reach the audience that we were hoping to reach. That's fantastic. And uh, I'll ask this one over to Luke now next. Um, one of the things that you both mentioned in talking about how Luke helped you out with the locations. And one of the things that I mentioned, you know, in my sort of preamble is that with Calgary and Alberta becoming a real burgeoning uh, film hub and being more and more recognized for what we have to offer, a lot of that is, I would say, part of the aesthetic of our, our terrain. You know, certainly what we have to offer is very different than what you would see in, say, a Vancouver or Toronto or Montreal. Luke, can you speak to that of why um, this has become such a very attractive place for filmmaking and how you also helped with In Plain View? Well, the way that we um, that we see it is that our vistas and our backdrops are kind of our calling card here. So as you look at the mountains, the badlands, the prairies, the foothills, and two municipalities of over a million people, um, all within a three-hour radius globally, that's pretty um, pretty uh, exclusive location to be able to do your production in. Um, given the fact that uh, that Scott and Matt were were locals here, we wanted to ensure. Um, not that we don't help everybody, but the idea is that you've got your local storytellers, you've got folks that are going to be hiring uh, local Albertans to do their productions. So you put in uh, the commitment that's necessary to ensure that their outcome is best as it possibly can with whatever assistance we could give them. So they're, you know, they're knowledgeable folks. So they had uh, a pretty good idea of what they were looking to do. And then we started to figure out where and when, um, also taking into consideration that, um, that, as Scott mentioned earlier, that he had such a huge budget that became pretty small, pretty quick. Um, so, you know, it, 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 there's, they, they understood what they wanted to do. We understood where the, the logistics were. We attached people to the project that could put together the packages, could, um, could create the environment so that they knew that what they were choosing could be filmed at within the capacity that they had, the financial capacity, and as well um, was going to lend to the betterment of the film. So that was the right location. So you have to connect your local talent here that understands the areas, that understands what's necessary to be able to get in, the logistics, all of the pieces that come into play. Um, and uh, then at that point, they were able to choose what, what fit best for the film. And as, as you saw it, um, it looked pretty damn good, I'd say, um, it represented Alberta very well. And so, you know, as, as I'm as I'm listening to uh, to Scott and Matt talking about, and Scott specifically on a couple points uh, about their process um, and about having their vision and and the detail that they went into in creating their project, this comes into play right at the beginning, right? As they start to look at what they need, if they go off course with that, everything changes. Everything changes. So they they spent a lot of time defining exactly what they how they wanted it to look, what they wanted to see out of it, and then adjust it accordingly as they went through the process so that they could refine it to the point that got onto the screen what you saw. So throughout that process, we just tried to assist where, where we could and make sure that they had access um, to the locations and to uh, specific uh, needs as they went through the process. And um, obviously it worked out very well. Um, congratulate both of them for being able to take this to, uh, to fruition. Thank you. And I guess I'll take those to Matt. Then you talked about having, having to have a vision started very earlier on. As a director, how did, you, how did your vision start and how did you see it evolve over the course of the production? It's, it's an interesting thing because, it, you know, it would, be, it would be nice to have 
over a million dollars or, or all, all the, um, uh, the, uh, the freedom, right? Like it, we had some limitations, money, locations, a number of things, but you can also look at those as, as creative um, inciters, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, so, so I think it's interesting to, to be in the locations phase because you start to see the movie, like there's a hotel in Longview that was potentially going to be the, the, the motel that, that we were using. And I was seeing these scenes play out in this, uh, in this particular space. And it ended up being way easier with the help of, of Luke to, to get, uh, what is now the, the, the no longer in existence Shamrock Hotel. So, uh, so to have that in the city and not have to worry about traveling everyone outside of the city and outside of the zone um, made it made it make way more sense. And it was a great location. Um, but I guess to answer your question, what I what I mean is sometimes your vision has to um, fit into the the things that you have at your disposal. And so that's why thinking uh, as a filmmaker about what you do have access to can help you you know form that vision. Um, and so you have to be flexible, uh, I think. And one of the things I liked about the film very much is that it definitely has a vision, it has an aesthetic. The film has a real aesthetic too, and I really appreciated that. Um, it was very, very well done. The next question I would say I'd put to all three of you to ask your opinion on it. We have seen certainly in the past few months alone, a lot of announcements that are very positive look moving forward for the Alberta film industry. We had the provincial government say they're going to remove the 10% uh, uh, tax cap on productions to try to get larger productions in. We had Wolver F. White saying they're going to have the, the new studio space, uh, the Fortress. Um, used to be, was intentionally supposed to be for oil and gas, but it's not. Um, we've seen a whole plethora of larger scale productions coming to the city. Uh, you know, obviously, Ghostbusters was large. You have Fraggle Rock, the Kate Beckinsale series. Uh, you have the ongoing Heartland, uh, Jan season three. A lot of productions really ramping up. When you look to the future in the next, say, five years or seven years, what do you think, the, where do you think it's going to go? I'll start with Luke. Um, yeah, so let's just say that there was 450, over 451,000 square feet of infrastructure that was absorbed. When that starts to happen in a jurisdiction, um, the confidence level builds significantly. So what you had here was a provincial government um, supporting the industry that identified they were taking the $10 million cap on per project off and increasing the budget that they had available, not only to deal with what's here today, but increasing it um, down the road as pressure was put on that, uh, on that incentive budget. So that was a extremely, um, it was a great day. I mean, we've been fighting and, and pushing and advocating for this for many, many years. So from that perspective, it was excellent. The absorption of the space means that outside world can look in and know that there is retrofitted facilities of a size and scope that are going to give them uh, the capacity to create the isolation that they need in their project specifically at this time and create the environment internally knowing that it's going to be available to them. And then thirdly, knowing that the crew base here uh, is extremely high end. Uh, whether you're working in the independent space or um, or you're working in the union and guild space throughout the, the province here we have some of the most talented crew and uh, talent that you're going to find anywhere on the planet in front and behind the camera from our perspective should we be given the ability to continue to function in the manner that we are right now and should we be able to grow incrementally and sustainably in the manner that we've uh, that we've indicated we'd like to. In the next five to seven years, you see this be a billion dollar industry that has between 10 and 14 crews actively working year round and looking to attract more crews and more capacity. We won't be Vancouver. We don't wanna be Vancouver. We do not have the infrastructure and the, and the capacity, uh, the critical mass to, to go to that place yet. Uh, maybe, you know, 15 years, 20 years down the road, that could happen, never know. Um, and we're not even Toronto. I mean, these are in industries that are 10 times our size. But what we can be is we can be effectively a job creator. We have the ability to not only grow our crew base, but bring them from underemployed sectors uh, with skill sets that we need. Um, we have the, the opportunity now that we have an incentive that's globally competitive to allow us to attract some of the talent that's migrated to other jurisdictions 
back to Alberta, which is now starting to happen. And we have the opportunity with post-secondary institutions like yourselves, where we are generating a talent stream of folks that come out um, with a lot of knowledge and a lot of ability and a lot of enthusiasm that then we harness, hopefully, and start training them in a way that brings them into the system and into that real world environment very quickly. So we're looking at all aspects to try to grow and develop the sector. And without having all three of those things working at the same time, which is incentives, infrastructure, and crew base, you can't sustain the industry. So that's part of it. And then overarching is safety. Right now, there is, you know, the, the main concentration on any project, it is no longer a line item. It is a budget upon itself. Any COVID activation um, needs to have the testing in place, the protocol in place to ensure anybody that's visiting us stays safe and specifically that our crew and our talent here stay safe and that we're, we are able to continue moving forward with film and TV. So it's a great place to be right now. There's lots of challenges, um, but we don't see them to your point earlier. We don't see them as impediments. We see them as challenges. As your two young filmmakers here um, saw the creativity that they had to up because of, of budgets, that's how we have to function. We look at where we have obstacles and we find ways and means to get around them. And we'll continue to do that and hopefully build this industry so that it's more than a you know, uh, that it's a significant uh, impact on our economy and on job creation. And of course, uh, a, a robust film industry affects other industries too and brings in more income. Uh, so it certainly is a, a domino effect. It's not just insular. You have all the different industries that help from uh, transportation, retail, restaurateurs, what have you. So it really, uh, the hospitality industry, it builds up the entire economy. Uh, it's huge. It's huge. It's so huge. If you look at some of the uh, impacts that, that projects like Ghostbuster had, on the economy of our small areas around the city. Uh, you start talking about Drumheller, you start talking about Didsbury and other places where they came in and spent a significant amount of money. That was an impact on those, uh, on those sectors. The one thing that we can't forget as we're growing this industry though, and as we're starting to create this, this stream of projects coming from afar that are building resumes and establishing themselves here and spending money is um, our, our local uh, producers. We, we need to ensure that as we're growing one side that we don't forget that the other side also needs to grow. There's a different access to funding for smaller projects. There's different access to support for smaller projects, but we need to be able to continue to do that um, so that we have a very even um, industry here. We have our local, our indigenous productions, our, you know, our local storytellers, and then we have our foreign and we've got to be able to mesh the two so that they, they work well in unison. And they're a great training ground for people that want to work on the on the bigger shows as well. So important on a variety of levels. Thank you for mentioning. There's two things I want to come back to. I'll get to, I want to get to Matt and Scott's view on sort of the future. But the two things I do want to come back to that you mentioned are COVID protocols and also the local and independent, because I think that those two are very important uh, to focus on. But first, I'll go back to go to Matt. But how do you see the industry when you look at the landscape um, and you see, you know, five years from now, seven years from now, where do you see both yourself? Uh, in uh, full swing productions, but also the larger industry as a whole. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I think I'll 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 just call a spade a spade, and I think that there it's it's fair to say that there are some people looking at this, say, an announcement like The Last of Us coming to the province as well. What does that mean for me? What is I you know I want to direct, I want to write, um, I want to make my own stuff. What is that? this how, how does this benefit me and i and i would say that that's a cynical view because there there are a lot of indirect ways that, that it's going to be a big benefit uh, as 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 the industry grows our community can grow um we're you know something as simple as as having an even more skilled labor force around people who just want to work in the film industry i mean imagine being able to to you know say hey you just worked on uh you know jesse james the assassination of jesse james would you come work on my film? And that person maybe says yes, because they're an Albertan and they're, and they're here to work. I mean, that's like world-class trained individual working on your indie movie. So there's that, and that's just one of many indirect ways that, that um, this is going to be a positive thing for, for our local community. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I would, uh, I would say it looks really positive. I, I'm, I mean, it's a very exciting outlook and, and to hear Luke, say, you know, we're not forgetting about, about the local people is really wonderful and, and exciting to hear too. And, and I think it's, I, I really encourage people to, to get involved in organizations like the CSIF and Ampia and FAVA in, in, in Edmonton and, you know, Prima, there are a bunch of small, you know, film collectives in the, in the you know, outs, uh, in the non-urban uh, centers. So 
uh, you know, get involved because I think it's going to be important to, to, to have your voice heard and find out, you know, how we can get more involved um, with these sorts of indirect um, uh, improvements in our industry that, that this is going to be a, a result of not just our industry, but the local creators as well. So yeah, I'm pumped. It's, I think it's, I think it's very exciting. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I, I knew you were going to find a way to get Ghostbusters into the conversation. Chris. <laughs> it would be hard not to, to be honest. <laughs> true uh, enough. True enough. Uh, but, but I really like enjoy what you just said though, but having a community and having that sort of, you know, it, it's one thing to say, you know, okay, but I can't get onto this production with Pedro Pascal, but no, but it does affect you in another way. And as the community grows, so do all those sort of infrastructures grow where you have the more mingling or blending of the independent with the more, say, studio productions, for lack of a better word. I think having that community there where people can sort of uh, uh, interact with each other and meet different people, um, I think that's a very positive thing. Uh, Scott, what would your thoughts be as you look to the future in terms of the next five years or seven years? Yeah, I think, you know, the next 12 months are going to be really tricky for independent producers because we won't be able to find crews. You know, everyone's going to be working on these big shows. And I think that's the best thing that could have happened to us, frankly. Um, and I think it's an opportunity for people who want to be producers um, to really see how, you know, a show like The Last of Us or the next Predators movie, you know, is made. You know, I, I, th I think about um, Tom Cox, who, who's uh, one of the producers at 724 Films. He's probably, you know, one of the biggest, most prolific producers of Alberta's history. And he started by production managing um, a show, a series, and that was how he started to develop a relationship with CBC. And that's what led to Heartland, which has led to, you know, all the North of 60 and all these other things that he's done. Um, so working on these shows is a way to start those relationships, you know, in, a, in an industry where relationships is what it's all about. So those, those kinds of relationships, um, you know, you can think of them as roots and they start to extend into Alberta from the larger film, you know, global film community. And so over the next five to seven years, we're going to see strengthening of, of those relationships. And we're going to see producers start to emerge here who have the knowledge base, crew base, and the relationships to actually create a self-sustaining local film industry. Yeah, so it's all it's a chicken and egg thing, but I think that, that it has to start with the film industry coming here. And that's what's happening this year for the, you know, in such a massive way that we've never really seen before. I think that's a really good observation. As you say, in the short run, it might mean that more independent is you're looking for crews and that might be a bit more difficult to come by. But in the longer run, you're bringing the industry to you, in which case will help you in the long run and help those independent productions with more experienced crew. Uh, and again, having more integration with those different production levels. Um, the one thing I want to talk about next that I think is important um, that uh, Luke had mentioned, and I think it, you know it's it's um, you can't really avoid it. Obviously, the issue of COVID, and certainly um, from an educational perspective, um, we we do we are educating our students in our productions to have the most up to date protocols of safety, the most up to date uh, way of understanding how serious it is to make sure that every production that they undertake is done with the utmost clarity that this is a paramount. This is not just an add-on. This is part of the production process. This is the way it's going to be. And what we see them is, you know, once you're graduating, that experience that you have will also be useful when you're graduating onto other productions that are, that are going on in, in the province. So my question is, with that as sort of my prelude, on my personal view is that these COVID protocols will be around for a while and that these sort of practices that were engaged in, in teaching students, teaching film productions, how to do this, whether it's a production, student production, a professional production, a production from Hollywood, but a local production, these sort of safety protocols, I don't think we'll be leaving anytime soon. What would be your thoughts on that? I'll start with Luke. Well, some of them should never leave. Um, some of them have been inherent in our practice for a long time. That's part of the process here is although that uh, across the planet, if you want to have um, Hollywood-based productions or studio-based productions, you're going to have to adhere to the SAG agreement with the unions, the guilds, and the studios. It's just the reality of it. And so I think it's, it's created an environment now where safety has always been, um, you know, at the top of the list for productions, but now it's, it's exceeding the protocol that we are given as a province and then as a country, um, and then on top of it as an industry, and our government has, um, has given the opportunity here, as, as most governments across the country have, for the industry to take the base protocol and then enhance it 
to the level that it needs to to ensure the safety of those that are um, that are on the set. So you're creating quadrants, you're creating the masking environment, you're creating a, a testing regime um, that identifies, you know, depending on which quadrant you're in, and the importance, and I'll use that as lack of a better term, the importance within the hierarchy of the production. If you're an actor or you're the director, you're probably going to be tested much more often um, than if you're a, a crew member that doesn't interact with those folks. So um, there's a variety of things that have come out of this that I think are extremely important to maintain. And it's how we look after each other because part of this whole process is you can identify protocol to the nth degree. You can be, and in some instances we are, um, have more protocol and more safety environment in place than you're gonna find in some hospitals and some care locations. So that's just the reality of how the studios engage. But what has to happen and what's core to the process working not just here, but globally, is what happens when people go home. So there needs to be, you know, if we ever talk about looking after your sister and your brother, um, this is really what it gets down to because you're not wearing the mask to protect yourself. You're wearing the mask to take care of the person across from you. You're also engaging in appropriate day-to-day -day activity. If you're working on a set on a project, that, a major project, a smaller project, and then sometimes even more importantly, on the smaller projects that aren't budgeting to shut down and restart and do whatever they need to do. So there is, um, there needs to be a, an adherence to the process uh, for the entire time that you're on the project. If you're doing protocol to the, you know, to the level you're supposed to on set and you're in the bar at night, um, it's probably not working well. Uh, you know, so we've seen some shutdowns again and, and we've gone back to stage one. Um, the film and television industry, uh, he says, touching wood, has been enabled to continue to function because of the level of, of safety and protocol that's implemented and that we're a business. Um, we, we do this on a daily basis uh, and we have to adhere to them. That's just the, the call. So it's, it's important. And I don't want to see all of it go away. There's portions of it. Absolutely. That just make it very tough to, to budget and be able to, to do a project appropriately. But parts of it, we've learned a lot. We had the, the safety aspect of looking up after each other should be maintained as we go forward. No, I'd agree. Thank you. Uh, over to Scott and Matt, your comments on the whole COVID protocols and how do you think that will affect your productions going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and we're still figuring it out, frankly. Um, there was a series that we were uh, that we shot for TELUS um, last summer and our crew was supposed to be, what would you say, Matt, 10, 15 people. And uh, we ended up having to pair that back to about six. And so, you know, that affects the quality of the work that you can do. Um, and it just, it, you, you start to, um, you have to find efficiencies even more so than you were before, because if your budget's not changing, you know, COVID protocols and safety protocols, those are not negotiable line items. You cannot skimp on those. So you have to find other ways to, you know, achieve your budget, achieve your, your the product you're trying to make um, in other ways. And it's just, it just requires ingenuity. It requires, you know, understanding of technology and how it works and how you can leverage it to, you know, get the most bang for your buck, really. Um, and and who, it, who is actually absolutely um, critical to have on a set uh, and who is not. Thank you, Matt. I would just add that I'm I'm so impressed when I whenever I I get to a set that that is taking uh, the precautions so seriously, um, and and it just it's just a really great reminder that this this community since we've got some state students in in the audience I'll tell a very quick story about how uh, without placing blame someone someone forgot to rent us a truck for a, for a shoot while we were uh, shooting at at state and. Uh, and no big deal, uh, you know, it happens if we're in a student environment, you know, mistakes, mistakes happen. But the question was, are we going to let this stop us or are we going to, to find a way to, to move forward? And we, we started loading up our cars and like little, little cars with gear and C-stands and, and, and we drove to the location as like a, a convoy and we, and we shot and we made it happen. And so I think film people just, just figure it out and solve problems and, and, it was a scary time when it first hit, and and it was it was it was interesting to to see um, seven twenty four and and Winona, you know, had stopped. They were, I believe, on a on a hiatus when it sort of hit, so they were already mid production, so they were able to continue without some of the challenges that insurance created for newer productions. Um, but they so they were the they were the ones in Alberta to to sort of set the tone, and and I, I've had a chance to look at their guidelines and their protocols and. It's incredible, and it's uh, and and it's still evolving. Of course, uh, like Scott said, we're still learning more. But 
it's just always amazing to see that you know film film and television folks just solve problems we we, we make it happen there's a resiliency and you almost have to be uh, films are such large endeavors both totally, yeah there's but financial fiscal endeavors uh, that you almost have to be resilient sort of plow through to figure out how to solve problems for sure um and then with that in mind <clears throat> going back to in plain view um now that it's behind you you've had success with it it's on amazon people are enjoying it if you had to do something differently looking at the entire process from all your perspectives uh with your work on it, including including luke um what would you do differently and that you will now apply to projects going forward. I'll start with Scott on that. Sure. Um, I think I think I would have um, at the outset spent a lot more time on locations. You know, we Luke pulled some, some some strings for us that really saved our ass, and that comes down to me not really understanding how important that was, um, and not you know not giving our locations guys enough enough time you know in the in the budget to actually go and scout the way they needed to um you know especially with a project that relies so heavily on locations um yeah it that was a big learning moment for me and then the other one was that that distributor nightmare that i that i hinted at um you know i i did a lot of due diligence before um in the contract scenario before we sign anything so we were able to get out of it and thank god but i think doing it again i would um I would vet that person a lot more thoroughly than I than I did. Um, is that is that something you could elaborate on? I know that this element can intimidate some students, and I try yeah. to justify it. Is that something you can elaborate on comfortably? I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I mean, you know, um, there there are a lot of standard things in distribution contracts, and and you know, as a producer, I, I didn't have anyone advising me, and there, you can find out what you need to online. You know, it was about, I think it was about seven solid days of me researching and finding out what clauses, what this meant and, and how was, how should we be protecting ourselves. Um, but, you know, what I should have done was, was look at this, this person that we were going into business with. And I should have picked up the phone and called every single filmmaker that he was working with to ask about him. You know, that was, I think, the mistake that I made was just like, oh, this guy wants to sell our movie. It's going to be great. And we'd met him in person and, and he seemed like a great guy. Um, he was, he was an awesome guy. We had, we had one of the greatest film meetings. That was what was so confusing about it. <laughs> we, we were in LA hanging out with, with producers. It was, yeah. I, I just want to add Scott, we did have a lawyer. We did, we did. And yes, of course. Not, of course, not yeah. to limit the work that you no, did, no, no, which yeah. was insane, but we did it. We did have some help from a lawyer, um, with reviewing the contracts before yeah, we started. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and help getting out of it too. He was, he was wonderfully helpful in that, in that regard. So yeah, that was, those are my lessons learned for sure. You know, and certainly glad to see that, you know, on the one hand, there are lots of wonderful creative people in the film industry, but also, to, you know, students should know going out to also, you know, have your guard up, um, make sure that you sort of protect yourself, do your due diligence. And, uh, you know, we've certainly all had those experiences, but I'm certainly glad that it worked out for you in the end. That's certainly a good thing. Sure. And that's, and then that's not a unique thing to the film industry either. That's everybody. Everywhere. Yes, yeah. that, yes, that's true too. Most every industry will have that sort of uh, element where you have to sort of have a bit of a guard. Thank you for adding that. That's a good point. Uh, Matt, would you like to elaborate on uh, what you would might do differently? Yeah, I, I would also point out just from the dis distribution angle, which I'm, it, it, it's the thing I know the least about and, and continue to learn uh, about, but one nice thing about uh, a self sort of self distributing in North America is we own the rights. So if we want to take it off prime and do a TV deal, or, or if we, we package our next movie with it to, for, we, we own those rights. So, so that's kind of nice to have control of that. And we can do that whenever we want. Um, a very quick uh, directing thing I would say is, you know, when you shoot a movie out of sequence, um, it's a bit easier when you shoot a short film because you have a more contained story. But you know, when you're not shooting a movie in story order, it's easy to forget the scene that came before and the scene that's going to follow. And I certainly wish I had done more uh, work on my transitions from scene to scene. Um, that's my biggest uh, my biggest wish is that I is that I had planned more around the way I was transitioning from moment to moment. I was too focused on the scene I was shooting, and I wasn't thinking about the audience experience as much as I should have been. So it was a big learning thing. Well, thank you for that. And Luke, was there, would, would there be anything in the process that you would see uh, that you would sort of recommend changing uh, for, for independent filmmakers moving forward? Well, it's tough because each project is different, right? Sure. And each filmmaker is different. And so how they're attached to their film, um, everybody's very fond of that IP and they want to be able to maintain it as much as possible when you go into the distribution 
game, everybody wants everything from you and they'll give you bits and pieces at the end. And you're supposed to be happy with that because it's going out to the world, but you've just spent your entire life <laughs> putting this thing together and that's not the way it works. So the distribution realm since 2008, um, when the writer's strike happened and um, distributors, a, a group of them were no longer, it was no longer viable for them to be in the, in the marketplace because the, the projects just weren't moving the way that they used to. At that particular point in time, we saw a major shift in how distribution was done, what was allocated financially for it, what, uh, what their investment is, their skin in the game to the project, how the project was released, where it was released, all of those things changed drastically. And to, um, to Matt and Scott's point now, I mean, you're, you can self-distribute. You can create an environment where you're on a high level platform, um, some of the most watched platforms in the world, and you're able to distribute it and maintain your IP. May take longer to recruit at the level that you'd need to and how things function, but at the end result is that um, as we've seen, what did we just run out of um, you know, for eight months? We ran out of content. Uh, they weren't making any for, you know, three and a half months. And that's what happens. That's the impact that it has. So now the drive is for many, um, many of the streamers is to have original content being made. So they pay to get the content made or they buy your content from you and they control all the windows and all the distribution that goes with it um, and the return. The way that, the, you know, these gentlemen have done is, is a more difficult path, obviously more, more uh, time intensive for them, but the end result could be much more satisfactory as they build their slate of projects that then at some point they can release in any way, shape or form and could potentially be the, the crossover piece that they need on one of their next films. It, it bundling together, it gives you that, those opportunities. So, you know, from my perspective, this, we have a lot to learn um, in this province in how we activate film and TV. We're, you know, we've got a long history. We've got a hundred years here, but as we start to see what happens when you get a little bit more congested, when it gets a little busier, when there's a little less resources, when, you know, the impact is greater, um, how you have to function in that zone. We've got some things that we have to do. And they, again, I go back to the point that no matter what happens on the uh, on the major productions, that we've got to have the ability to produce the independent projects that we're doing. And if we don't, um, this will be a very different marketplace. And we can see it on two sides of the country: um, one that's a service production, um, you know, group, and one that that has a huge amount of the the broadcaster and the and the, the Canadian content going on. And you see the difference in how those uh, those areas work. I think it would be nice to have Alberta be right in the middle there where we're supportive and we're able to, to create that environment, but at the same time, support the big projects and allow those to happen and um, really make your jurisdiction a, a top of mind jurisdiction as soon as they start thinking about where to do their projects. Um, but, you know, these gentlemen went through a lot of roots and a lot of and, and painstaking, you know, we watched it from the outside a bit and I've worked with them on a couple of different projects that, you know, we just, they, they're committed to their craft and they wanna make sure that ultimately that they get the best out of themselves and out of their crew and out of their project as possible. And uh, that makes for a lot of work. So you gotta be committed. And that's one of the things I think that we, um, we need to ensure that people understand as they're getting into their own production, that that commitment level has to be there. There has to be money to pay people. Everything on friendships doesn't work after a while. You gotta, you know, you gotta grow and develop and the outcome is gonna be what you see here. They're, they're successful local filmmakers that have opportunities um, coming down the pipe that, um, you know, they're going to make them more successful. So that's kind of the process. You got to commit. And I, that's a wonderful answer. And I guess what uh, the next part of my question then kind of goes to what we're talking about having a focus on independent local, which I think it, it can't be stated enough. And I think you obviously all agree. Um, there's always been a debate in Canada. Certainly, you know, once you had going into the 80s and 90s, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's one thing to get the film made, but so many of our screens were taken up with largely Hollywood product. And um, certainly now you have like the Marvel films, Star Wars, what have you. And there's always been that sort of debate is, should the film industry or should the government regulate um, and have a percentage of Canadian films you need to have on screens, uh, much like they do with CanCon and TV or, the, or, the, or the, the music industry. My question though is with the advent, and there's always been pros and cons to that, with the advent of streaming, um, as you've talked about, and the fact that you own the rights. Do you think that streaming, which seems, I would argue, to overtake theatrical, certainly post-COVID, um, and with having films released day and date streaming and at the theaters, do you think streaming will help alleviate that issue of getting your films actually seen? We'll start with Scott. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot easier to send somebody a link to the movie on Amazon Prime than it is to ask them to go see it in a movie theater. Right. And, it, you know, we're, we're in a massive transition right now. And I don't think it's the end, of, you know, by any stretch. I think we're going to see the barriers continue to come down between storytellers and their audiences. And that's true for everything. Right. I mean, we're seeing we've seen it. You know, basically, we're, we're following what happened in the music industry 15, 20 years ago. Um, it's just a lot harder to make a movie than it is to make a song. Um, so, yeah, I don't think there's, um, you know, I think, I think that the streamers are going to find that, that there's, you know, there's a lot of debate about that exact same thing, you know, when it comes to Netflix in Canada, you know, they're obviously, they're investing a lot of infrastructure here and, and that's great. And so, um, yeah, I, I'm curious to see how those conversations go in the next five years, because um, I honestly have no idea. It certainly is evolving, and it's certainly hard to see and just see how much the landscape's changed in the past the past five years um, and the past one year with COVID and whatnot. So, mm. no, I certainly agree. It's hard to sort of foresee that, um, but we see where we're going. Matt? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a crystal ball question, I think, but I think one thing to remember when it comes to theatrical versus streaming is, or TV or radio is that, you know, you're going to gather... Uh, viewership by virtue of just the fact that it's on TV. So if, so if we run the Simpsons on a local channel, followed by a, can, a piece of Canadian content, you're going to get audience just rolling right into that piece of Canadian content with theatrical. It's a different equation, right? Because you're looking up at the board, what's available to what, what can I spend my dollars on directly to see? And that's, so, so it's a, it's a different question. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I'm very curious to see how, how the governments throughout the world um, approach making sure that their own culture is represented in, in the streaming services. And I know that, you know, that's a big conversation that, that is happening right now, for sure. Yeah, it is a larger conversation, that's for sure. And it certainly is one that will, will continue to happen at all. Uh, Luke, your thoughts on that, how streaming might change things? Well, I think it already has. I think that uh, there's a couple of things that make Canada unique um, to the point uh, that we're, we're that uh, Matt just brought up is in regards to how you balance the streamer ensuring that they're doing the Canadian content as well as foreign content and how we create that. You go into places like um, going to India um, where you have seven streaming services that are bigger than Netflix and Amazon um, that are all for local content, right? So you see throughout the world that the majority of the world creates for their audience in their country. We have a very unusual situation here. We have the biggest elephant in the room next door. And so you can create a project here that costs you a million dollars an episode, let's say. And they're next door making a project that's $10 million an episode. You take second window as a broadcaster on that project. You just got that project for $100,000 an episode. Um, so, you know, the, the balance is satisfying your audience with the need, but also ensuring that you maintain um, your Canadianness, if you will, in the content that's being created here. Um, no other country on the planet has the same impact on it that we do. The greatest, the, the largest creator of entertainment for the globe is next door to us. And so how do we deal with that on a consistent basis? So truly important that the Canadian stories are told. It's important that they are prioritized as much as possible. Um, and that we create a, a balance that allows us to not lose that cultural aspect of our stories that we need to ensure uh, from generation to generation is there. Thank you. No, that's a wonderful answer. Um, I know we're running out of time. So there's one question I had that was posted by a student <clears throat> that I'd like to have your take on it, actually, for all of you. Um, obviously, we have students that are getting ready to graduate. And they're, you know, they're, they're excited, they're concerned, there's a whole flurry of emotions. And what they've asked here is, how do I make myself stand out and what are some common mistakes we should avoid on a resume? So I'll let Scott start. Sure. Um, I think, you know, as you're, as you're graduating, especially right now, um, there's never been a better time to start in this industry. And there is no knighting ceremony. There is nobody who says, you're a filmmaker now, you can call yourself a filmmaker and, and uh, go, you know, go forth and film. Um, if you make films, you are a filmmaker. So imposter syndrome is the biggest thing that stops people from doing what they need to do the most. And that is reach out to people working in the industry and start building relationships. Doesn't have, you don't have to call it networking if you don't, if you hate that word, because I do too. Um, 
but it is the people that you have met at SAIT and the people that you meet in the early days of your career that are going to impact the route that your career takes. And if you are going through the film program right now, you've heard it a million times, attitude, attitude, attitude is really what matters most. Um, and that's because it's a relationships business. Um, it's in, and it's a friendships business. We were able to make in Plainview because Matt and I were friends, right? We knew each other, we graduated, we went through state together. So those, those things take time. Um, and I think you'll find as you start to get into this industry that um, it's not as, as this, there's not this black curtain between you and the industry that it might seem when you're, when you're getting into it. And there are a lot of people who want to help and want to provide advice and want to work with you on stuff. So I'm not, I'm not really as concerned about the resume as, as, uh, as you might think when you're building one. I'm more concerned about meeting you and talking to you and seeing the work that you're making. Thank you, that's really good advice. Thank you, Scott. Matt? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I would certainly echo the, the attitude <clears throat> comment. And, and the tough part is with that is that attitude, I think really directly relates to self-awareness and self-awareness is, is a, sometimes a tough thing uh, to teach. Uh, I don't know that, that it's something that everyone automatically has, but, uh, but, you know, I, I think it's important to not stress about it, but certainly review your, your actions and decisions uh, sometimes and, and, and think about how it impacts your, your attitude and, 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 um, and to, to also respond to RS and in, in the, in the questions there, uh, do you believe passion and drive isn't enough to make it in this industry? I, I would say if you add resilience, then yes. Uh, <laughs> Yes, the resilience is super important. Thank you. That's wonderful advice, Matt. Thank you. And Luke? A lot of it's the same. You know, realistically, it's, um, it's relationship building. It's uh, getting into a situation where you're, you create connections. You got to be humble. You got to do all the jobs. It's just the reality of it. You got to do what's necessary. You got to be committed to the craft. And no matter what that is, no matter if you're starting at, at, at the, uh, the bottom end of a, of a project or you're halfway through or getting to the top, you got to be committed to it. And you got to, you got to learn, um, you know, people are going to, uh, in this industry, people are going to turn to those that they know that they can count on. If you've got a, a project that you are limited in the amount of people that you can hire, you're going for those people that you know have skill sets have ability, have the right, um, the right attitude and the right, uh, you know, take on what you're doing and are committed to taking it from the beginning to the end. Um, so it's, a, it's an important process as you're coming out to ensure that you use the resources around you as well. There's lots of locations within our infrastructure, within our ecosystem that you can draw information from, um, that you can draw assistance from, that you can even draw financial assistance from. So there's ways and means to get out there. You need to explore a bit. You need to ask the questions and you need to know that when you're coming out of your post-secondary education that you don't know everything. Um, and 10 years down the road, you need to know that you don't know anything. And 20 years down the road, you don't know much. So it's a, we're always, it's a constant learning environment here. And I think that we, uh, we get to a point where um, if you're well seen in the industry, people are going to want to help you. If you do the right things, people are going to want to help you. This is the industry here in Alberta. You know, there's, um, we're open. People are, are interested in seeing the other person do well. Um, if they're a person that's appreciative of the assistance and the help that they're getting. So it's balancing it out. Thank you. That's wonderful advice too. I've been advised we can have at least one or two more questions. One of the questions that came up also is, <clears throat> excuse me, we talk a lot about um, the production of the film and bringing the industry, um, but sometimes people forget it's a post-production. And some, uh, one student had asked, do you think there's an opportunity to have more post-production studios coming to Calgary and uh, so forth? Um, I'll let Scott start off. Sure, yeah. I mean, we, you know, we do have some, some fantastic post-production facilities in Calgary. Um, and, and historically, it has been challenging sometimes because a lot of the productions that shoot here go and post somewhere else. But there's a new organization that's come out called APA, the Alberta Post-Production Association. Um, and they are really starting to give the post-production community a voice. They're definitely a group to check out and to join. Um, but I think as far as infrastructure goes, that would be something that Luke could speak to better than I can. Okay, I'll go over to uh, Luke. Well, to, to have um, a growing community, um, to have a growing ecosystem, post-production has to be part of it. And to, to Scott's point, what used to happen here is you, you had a cap on any project that you were doing. So if you were doing an interprovincial uh, co-production or you're doing a, a production here where you hit that cap, you're going to look at other areas either throughout the country or other locations 
to ensure you can uh, maximize your incentivization in those areas, right? So you can actually do it at the top level. Um, foreign producers, a lot of them want to be able to take the projects home with them. As soon as they're finished producing, they want to go back and sleep in their own beds. What has happened and lasted a while is technology has allowed them in real time and in real color to be able to see exactly what is happening in an edit suite that could be in Calgary, that they could still be garnering the incentives to have our people working on that project and, uh, and creating it. So the post-production industry is extremely important to us. We need to ensure that we grow. And I think we're at a point now where we can in good faith turn to them and say, there's going to be enough productions coming through here. And with the quality of talent that exists here and the level of incentive that we have, that we have the opportunity to grow. And to Scott's point, APA has been a, a driving force in this. There is a provincial uh, grant um, that is available, the post-production grant that's available to enhance um, those production organizations, post-production organizations to uh, be competitive and keep those productions here or be part of those productions during the time that they're here in a more substantive way because they bring some, um, some incentivization to the table. So absolutely crucial for us at long-term to ensure our post community our production community, our effects community, our audio, all of those areas um, grow along with the rest of the industry. Thank you, that's certainly good to hear. It's certainly positive for the post end of it. And with that, I'll go over to Matt. <clears throat> one of the things I appreciate about In Plain View is we talked about the vision, the, the visual aesthetics and locations, but I also appreciated the sound going back to post-production. Can you tell us a bit about the sound design and creating that sort of feeling of desolation, that feeling of desolateness and how you utilize the sound in post-production? Yeah, I mean, being that it was it was a, a first time feature for me, I mean, I, I leaned a lot on on not just our, our sound team, but also our composer uh, Alec Harrison, and and the whole so 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 the audible experience um, is is really great, and not to my credit at all, it's to those guys, um, you know, Frank Larada as well, uh, and and uh, Propeller Sound, they they do incredible incredible work, and what what if what I can point to is, is learning. And what I learned uh, a lot about was how much story is told with sound. It's simple things that we don't think about or don't register um, when we're watching a piece of content, like footsteps or a door opening, it might be subconscious, but it's actually telling a lot of story. And, and it can be really, really important to making a scene make sense. And we don't even really register it. So uh, so yeah, I mean, I guess the best answer I have for you is it's important, um, but it's, 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 a, it's a whole art form onto itself for sure. Well, thank you very much. I see that brings us to time, um, but I want to I'll let Madeline come back. But before I go, I personally would like to thank Luke, Matt, and Scott for their time and their insights. And I know that they'll be very appreciated by the students uh, who are watching this today. I'd also like to say, please watch In Plain View on Amazon. It's a wonderful film and something we can all really be proud of. It. So thank you. I know it was a, a lot of work, but thank you for doing that work. It was really, really, really enjoyed it. And I certainly ask everyone to go and watch it. I'll turn it back over to Madeline. Thanks for moderating, Chris. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Chris. I feel like I could talk to you guys, or not talk to you, listen to you. I don't need to say anything. I could just listen to you guys for hours. One of the great things about my job is that I get to meet grads from all different industries. So I feel like I kind of get to lift the veil on all different sorts of worlds. So this has been wonderful. Thank you for your time. I would like to thank Luke and Chris. Thank you. And a huge thank you to Matt and Scott for joining us and sharing your experience and congratulations on the film. What a great accomplishment. Um, we're really, I know all of us at SAIT love following uh, you guys and your company, and we can't wait to see what's happening next. To all the alumni, students, and staff who joined us, thanks for attending, and thank you for your thoughtful conversation. Um, it was a really great discussion. I want to shout out to TD Malash Monix, Manulife, and Maurer, who support all SAIT of alumni events. If you have any other questions, or there's something that you'd love to see discussed throughout our What Works series, um, please email us at alumni at safe.ca. Our next What Works event is on April 22nd. We'll be talking about the School of Digital Advanced Technology and the programs and op opportunities for alumni that are looking to reskill and continue their education. So stay tuned for more info on that. Uh, with that, we'll come to a close. Thank you everyone for your great questions. Thanks for joining us and thanks you guys for a wonderful conversation. Thanks, thanks to for see. having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Great. Take care. Thanks, Be well. Take care everyone. Be well. Take care. Bye-bye.